They're they're good for different things, man. Mm. But um, they both have the same basic, the same basic worldviews, the same basic, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Propaganda. Propaganda. The same. They're trying to hypnotize you in the same way, right? And it's all done on purpose. I think we've discussed this before, and we'll discuss it certainly a bit later. But they're trying to destroy the masculine imperative to prevent revolution. So it's all kind of the same. There's certain things I respect about each country. Um, but it was good to certainly at a young age move around a bit as well. It, it allowed me to never, ever really settle in a school and make a bunch of good friends or anything like that. So I always understood, even from a young age, how to make people like me quickly and also how unimportant the relationships from those people were, right? I wasn't a kid who's like, oh, I'm going to miss my best friend. I was like, okay, you're my best friend for two years. Peace. I'm out. I was like that. So that's probably another reason why me and my brother are so close. So yeah, it was a good upbringing. I can't have nothing bad to say about it. But I was just raised by the OG. My dad was a G. Big, black, chess master, huge, drinking, gambling, pimping. Like he's just out here. He was just that guy, right? <laughs> I mean, like, so he was like that to the end. So he was a hero. Yeah. So chess, I mean, obviously my father was a chess master, right? So I had to, I had to learn the game. He sat me down. I spent a lot of time learning it. And to this day, I have massive respect for chess. So much respect for the game. It's so much harder at that world level than people can even fathom. Unless you even play the game, you can't even anticipate how good these people are at the game. They're, they're effectively computers. I don't think you can even be good at chess at that level without having something a little bit wrong with you. You gotta be on the spectrum somewhere. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Because it's crazy how good these guys are. But yeah, chess is an amazing thing. I still play chess every day. I'm, I'm not world level or anything. I'm around 1750, 1800 ELO. Um, if anyone knows chess, that's what I am. But yeah, it, it what would that be considered uh, better than average? High, high certainly, to... certainly better than average. Yeah. You know, it's, the average player, let's say, is around a thousand or something. Okay. But okay. my dad was twenty four hundred. Okay. Twenty five hundred. Damn. Okay. So yeah, so I, I'll give you an example. My dad could beat me without looking at the board. So my dad would be in the kitchen, fucking around the kitchen, cooking dinner. I'd be in front of a chessboard in the living room. And I'd say E4, he'd say C C6. Knight <laughs> F3, Knight C3. God and damn. Boom, and he'd damn. smoke me without looking at the board. That's how good Shit. the bet is. It's, wow. it's insanity. Yeah. But um, I do think it's a good basis for life. There's certainly a lot of lessons in chess. There's certainly a lot you can attribute to chess from, from everyday life to the chess board. And I think it's a good it's a good grounding mechanism. I enjoy to sit down for a good couple hours, win some games, lose some games. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'll give you my favorite one first. Yeah. Please do. My favorite one is, is the difference between the king and the queen. Mm. Right? Because the king moves one square at a time. And the queen can just zip across the board, right? So you're here in Miami, you're partying in Miami. They got all these parties right now. It's Art Basel, blah, blah, blah. You see all these chicks on a boat. For the man to get on that boat, it's one square at a time, right? He has to get a good job. He has to get his taxes right. He has to find a way to leverage credit. He has to meet the guy who sells the boats. He has to go through all this shit stage by stage by stage to finally pull off being on that yacht and having that yacht at the age of 56. A chick, what does she need? Lip fillers, <laughs> boom, zip, on. She gets straight on. That's the difference between the king and the queen. But although the king is slower than the queen, he's the most important piece, right? The king can't die. The queen can die. The queen, sometimes you can be looking at a position and go, this is fucked up. The only way out of this is to sacrifice that bitch. Mm. Sometimes you can do it. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a very quick story. This is a story I've never told before. When I was, how old was I, 23? When I was 23, I was dating a ballerina. She was the prima ballerina of the Cambridge Ballet School in England. And I had no money. I was a fighter, but I was coming up. I didn't really have any money. And she lived far away, like an hour and a half away. But she used to come see me. And we were good for like a year, year and a half. I love this girl. Yeah. And uh, she finished ballet school. She started dancing in clubs in London. She couldn't get any ballet work. So fi surprise, surprise. Who fucking was ballet work, right? So she ends up doing like dancing and uh, not stripping, but like dancing in the club, you know, da -da. So now she's around all the, mo the London money every day. She's out dancing all the time. She's up late every night. She doesn't want to drive an hour and a half to come see me. None of this shit. So we're kind of falling apart a little bit. And uh, she ended up talking to someone famous, David Hay. I don't know who he is. He's a boxer. Mm -hmm. So David Hay starts texting this bitch, right? Back and forth to the... So anyway, when I finally saw her again, she was like, we had an argument. She's like, well, you know what? You think you're a fighter? This guy, that guy, this guy, that guy. I'm like, look, if you're going to go fuck idiots, at least do it for money. And she's like, what do you mean? I was like, well, if you're going to go fuck idiots, at least you get paid because they don't give a fuck about you. Like, if you're going to play this game, at least do it for money. Right. So I had this argument with her back and forth, and I explained to her that these men are just going to use you. If you're going to do it, at least get paid. And when she left the house, Tristan said, why are you telling her to fuck other dudes? I'm like, no, I'm just understanding that in my chess position, I've lost this game. Right. Mm. The game is done now. Just sooner or later, she's out. All we do is argue. She's in the club every night. 
I'm just trying to say before she leaves, maybe I can get a little bit of money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's the queen sacrifice, right? Right, right. She, we, we broke up three months later. I don't know if she fucked him or not or who she fucked. I don't know. I never spoke to her since. But that's kind of the, the analogy you have to be able to apply to life. Sometimes chicks got to go. Yeah. Sometimes they have to go to save the king. And uh, too many dudes, most of the time, men truly lose at life. It's because they've attached themselves to a queen and they won't let her up. They won't sacrifice her. No, no matter what. I promised I'm going to stick by you. This, uh, our marriage vows, no matter what, no matter what. And they just stay on that sinking ship till she eventually leaves his ass. Even worse, what most queens do, queens, I don't want to use queens, what most women do nowadays, especially in the West, yeah. I see women getting their men in trouble all the time. Do you know how many times I've seen chicks start in fights for their dude to have to mop up? My man's going to be, be, be. And yep. the man's like, oh, fucking shut up, man. Yep. There's, there's four of them. Yep. Do you know what I mean? Like, even if he's a big dude, he's like, I don't really need this now today. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Man, I, I, another story. I have so many stories in my life. My life's been cool. Back around the same time, I'm 22, 23 years old, kickboxer. I was British champion. I wasn't world champion at the time. It was four in the morning. The club just ended. I was in a chicken and chip shop. It's an English thing. They sell like fries and fried chicken and, and they're open 24 hours. Like, yeah, something like that. Mm -hmm. And there's a long line. Uh, an Audi with tinted windows pulls up. These three big black guys get out, push straight in front of the whole line, go straight up to the front, cut in front of five people and start ordering. My girl goes to me, we've been waiting here ages. I said, shut the fuck up. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. She goes, are you just going to let them push in? I said, shut the fuck up. So I made her be quiet, right? Anyway, the man two, two in front of me, not this guy, the guy here, he couldn't tell this bitch to shut up. She's like, excuse me, excuse me, there's a line. And the guy turns around and goes, you think I don't see the fucking line? I don't care about a fucking line. So she starts running her mouth. Bro, this dude knocked her the fuck out. Oh, man. Whack, clean, out cold. By the time her man looked at her and looked back up, Boom, sparked, done. Whoa. Both of them. And I stood there and watched both of them just laid out clean. That fatalities, bruv. It was, it was, I wouldn't be surprised if they both had permanent damage. It was bad. The, the three dudes who ordered the chicken and chips didn't even take their food. They started laughing, walked back out, got in the car. And I turned around and said to my girl, you see, some people are just ready to fucking go to jail. Some people are ready to kill people over fucking nothing. You want me to fight? Oh yeah, I can fight. But what am I fighting these three dudes for? What, fries? Yeah. What, fries in a 10 minute delay? Damn. Man, and this is what bitches will get you into this shit. Yeah. Bitches will get you into this shit fast. And that's why when I see dudes saying, oh yeah, she's just my friend. You're hanging around with girls and they're not even giving you pussy and they might get your ass killed. What the fuck is wrong with you, with man? Girls are a liability. They're a liability to have around you because you have a duty to protect them in some regard. I curate my experience very, very carefully. Any woman I'm around, I understand I have to protect. So she better suck something. So I ain't fucking sitting around being friends with no bitch. Because I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen so many men have their ass kicked over chicks. It's, inc it's incredible. 100%, man. They're, they're, they're a liability. And, and it's not necessarily just completely their fault. Yeah. But if you're rolling with a chick who won't shut up and you tell her to shut up, you need to be careful, man. And, and Myron nailed it. There's a big difference between fighting and violence. Yeah. Like, I'm a professional fighter, right? I know how to fight. But fighting and violence are different things. Yeah. If I wanted to get violent on somebody, I'd just run them the fuck over. Like, that's forget fighting. Right? If someone, if somebody who hurt my family was on the sidewalk, I'm not gonna get out and fight the guy. I'm just gonna just run him over my fucking truck. We'll talk about violence. You know, violence is a very different thing. And women don't understand the difference between fighting and pure violence. And they also, you're completely right, they don't understand the true physical difference between a man and a woman. Yeah. All this female self-defense, I can fight too, it's all bullshit. Mm -hmm. It's complete garbage. A man who's genuinely enraged, you don't stand a chance. I'm sorry, the best thing you can do is scream and run. I'll tell you another example. Even a teenage boy. Oh, no. You don't destroy a, a grown yeah. woman. I had a girl who did uh, self-defense classes. This is like a couple years ago. And she goes, oh, you're a kickboxer. I want to show you like my self-defense. And if you grab me, I do this, I do this, I do this. I said, listen, bitch. <laughs> if I grab you and you start trying to be a little ninja, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fucking smash you. Whack, 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 whack. Done. Now your whole face is busted. Like you, you, you're forgetting the, the part of the equation where I just beat you up for like three seconds, and you're done. Now drag your ass to the bushes. What the fuck you talking about? It's garbage, man. I'll give you another example of a guy I saw get fucked up because of his chick. I was outside a club in England. And one more thing for the American guys watching this: anyone who thinks England's like you know nice suits and little posh people, England, Shanks. Hey, bro, England's violent. Very dangerous. Shanks, Shanks, very, very, very dangerous. Yeah. I would actually say, although you have guns here, I'd say the mentality as a whole is more dangerous there. People are about it. They're just a crazy island, and they always have been. So it's a very dangerous place. Chef, yeah, yeah. Chef G. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have it missing here. I don't know if you can zoom in. My finger came off from a blade. Oh, all shit. the way off. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's, that's a long story. I was walking to a car late at night. And I was arguing with the... I don't know if you can see the scar there. Yeah. had to be sewn back on. God damn. 
So uh, I, I'm mixing stories now, but yeah, I, was, okay. I, I had arguments with the guy by text. He stopped replying. Two days later, as I walked to my car at night, they tried to kill me. And that also shows a lot about intent, right? Because when they with intent, they don't threaten. That shows you how, you know, I was arguing with the guy and he goes, all right, just stop replying. And that shows true intent because he tried to kill me. That's another story I can't say on Fresh and Fit. But uh, <laughs> I, I saw a dude get knocked the fuck out again. Even when women have the best intentions, they're a liability. I saw a guy outside a nightclub. He's arguing with another guy. His chick's in the way going, leave it, leave it, stop, stop, don't do it. Da -da. Be in the way, being a fucking idiot. Anyway, she holds, she grabs her guy, like, go, oh, stop, stop, holds onto his right arm. Stop, stop. Boom, he gets knocked out. You're holding on your dude's arm. How the fuck's he gonna fight? Even if you don't want him to fight, you're just gonna hold on his arm saying, stop, 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 and let him get sparked. I tell my chicks all the time, if we're walking down the street and any kind of altercation comes, run and fucking scream. Fuck off. You're no good to me next to me. You're, you're no good to me in between. You're no good to me next to me. You're no good to me shouting stop. You're no good to me holding on to me. Just fuck off. Run over there and scream and get somebody else and leave it to me. Even if there's a hundred of them, leave me by myself because these chicks will get you fucked up, especially the ones who aren't trained. And even if they have the best intentions, if they panic, what they're going to do, they're going to grab you because you're their man, right? Oh, oh, oh. They're going to stop you from being able to fight. Yeah, they're a fucking liability. Dude, you're walking out here with chicks and they're untrained. At least my chicks are trained. I literally will sit down with girls and say, look, if something goes off, especially where I live in the world, Romania, these kind of countries, if something goes off, run and scream. Should, I, should I tell you the story quickly? Yeah, tell us the story on that one. All right, so I'm with my dad. My dad, my dad's a chess player, but he's also like a park hustler, right? So like he'd go to the, the parks and play chess against the other chess guys to make quick money. So he'd go in there and offer him ridiculous odds, like three to one, four to one, give them more time, whatever. And he'd sit down in the park and he'd, and he'd bust them up. My dad was really good at chess, but he was ultra aggressive. So like grandmasters hated playing him. A few times he lost spectacularly because he went too hard, but there's some few times he had crushing victories, like just wrecked the grandmaster because he just went completely all out defenseless. He was like an attacking player. Damn. So uh, I remember I was about eight years old. I told this story on my Tate speech, my YouTube channel. I was about eight years old. Yeah, I read it and I was like, that's definitely your father's Yeah, yeah, yeah. Story. I was about eight years old. And my dad, even when he was still alive, because I only speak English, right? Even though I live in Romania. And I said to my dad, do you think I should learn another language? And he sat, he turned to me and said, you don't even speak English. And what he meant is most people don't even have a, a grasp of the English language. Think how many words are in English you don't even know, right? So his, what he was saying to me is you don't need to learn anything else, you need to learn English, mm -hmm. which was funny. But my father spoke a very particular brand of English and that's what this story is about. So it was Detroit, it was three in the morning. We were in a gas station. I was walking around. I remember looking at the Cheetos. I'm eight, who doesn't like Cheetos? <laughs> and I heard an altercation near the front near the front of the till. I heard like some scuffling, etc. I don't know what exactly happened, but I came to the front and my dad was getting jumped by four Mexican guys. Right? So they're hitting him, bang, bang. One of them got a bottle, start smashing him. They're beating the shit out of him. Even as my dad was getting his ass kicked, I'm eight, I'm standing there just frozen. As he was getting his ass kicked, he turned to me and I remember he almost, he growled at me and he went, run to me as he was getting beaten, right? He managed to get one of them and hold him tight and must have bit in his face because or whatever he bit, he had flesh in his mouth by the time the whole thing was done, right? So he bit something off. So there's blood everywhere. Anyway, the shopkeeper starts screaming, so he's going to call the police. It kind of starts tussling, goes half outside. My dad manages to stay inside. The, the Mexican guys run off. My dad's covered in blood. His head's cut. He bit that guy's, I think he bit the guy's lip off. Mm -hmm. So there's blood all down the face. And he's absolutely covered in blood. He's drenched in blood. And I'm standing by the drinks cabinet, still just standing there. So he told me to run. So what the fuck are you going to run in a 7-Eleven? So I'm just standing by the drinks cabinet. He said, son, son. So I came over there and my dad's standing there. He's talking to the shopkeeper. The shopkeeper was Korean saying, it wasn't your fault. It wasn't your fault, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, police come and the police look through the CCTV. They see that my dad fought all these guys off. And the police officer said, so what's your job? What do you do? And he was taking the, the statement. My dad said, I'm a chess player. And the police officer said, chess player? Maybe you should be something else. And my dad replied, my unmatched perspicacity coupled with sheer indefatigability makes me a feared opponent in any realm of human endeavor. <laughs> in the report. But what my dad was saying, unmatched perspicacity. Perspicacity, perspicacity is the ability to perceive, right? Perception. My unmatched perception. Indefatigability is the, ability to, is the inability to become tired. So he's saying I have unmatched perception and I never become tired. And that's why I'm a feared opponent in any realm of human endeavor. And I remember that quote from when I was eight years old. Wow. That's a badass way to talk. I'm yeah, jealous to this God day. Damn. People think I'm good on my podcast. That's how my dad just spoke through life. He'd just been rattled to the brain. 
and that's how he gives a police report. Like the, yeah, my unmatched perspicacity coupled with sheer indefatigability makes me a feared opponent in any realm of human endeavor. Yeah. Man. So when I was a child, I was playing chess all the time with my father. I was the state chess champion of Indiana. I was on my way to become a grandmaster. And then when my uh, mother and father decided to break up, we decided to move back to England because England has a social housing, social housing program, right? In America, you're broke, you're broke. But in England, you can get a house, you get a bit of food, that kind of stuff. It's actually kind of crazy not to get political, but Americans, especially the conservatives, are constantly harping on about, we don't want this to become a socialist country. And they call Europe socialist countries. But the tax rate in England is about the same as here. Wow. And there you get free health care, a free house if you're broke. But what do they give you in America? Nothing. They're too busy bombing countries. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> Stupid. So, um, yeah, so we moved back over there. My and dad Andrew is American for you guys that are I'm wondering. American. Yeah. He's I'm American, American and yeah. he's British, guys. Yeah, so I'm half half. So uh, my dad stayed here in America, so I lost my chess coach. And uh, it's hard to stay dedicated and stay good without a coach, right? So right. for a long time, I played a bit of chess. I did a little bit back and forth, etc. And when I realized I needed probably 13, 14, I was missing all that time I spent playing chess. I was looking for something that was similar, and I ended up choosing fighting. I started with karate. I got a black belt in Shotokan, and I moved on to kickboxing. And I fought K1, and I've had MMA fights as well. So to me, they're very, very similar. They're one-on-one. -on -one. There's no luck involved. Uh, I don't really like, I didn't want a team sport because in a team sport, you can have a bad day, still win, a good day, still lose. No, I want it all on the line, right? I didn't want a sport with any luck. That's the thing about chess. It doesn't matter how well you played. It doesn't matter how nearly perfect the game was. If you lost at some point, you made a mistake. Even if you can't identify it, at some point you have made a mistake. And that's a fantastic metaphor for life as well. Because there's so many people out here who don't take responsibility and they'll come along and go, well, COVID happened. That's why I lost all my money. No, I don't buy that. I don't give a shit what happened. At some point, you did not diversify. You did not prepare yourself. You made a mistake. So the four girls flew in. I sat them all down at a table. They're all like, who's this chick? Who's this chick? Told them all the truth. I just straight sat there. Just sat there and said, listen, I've been with you all. I'm starting a webcam business. I'm going to get rich. Some of you are going to come with me to the top of the mountain, or if you're pissed off, you can fucking fly home. So a woman can't go around fucking people and pretend it's the same as a man running around fucking people. It's absolutely not the same. If I, a man can only cheat if he loves someone else. If I have a woman who I truly love and I go out and fuck and I come back to her and I don't care about her and I only love my girl, that's not cheating. That's exercise. If she even talks to a dude, it's cheating because females are emotionally invested. I have no emotional investment. So no, I'm making this very, very clear. Any woman who was with me never, never even, the only men they spoke to besides me were my brother, hi, and the guys online who were paying them. That is it. They were absolutely loyal to me. And if they weren't, they got fired. And any feminist will disagree with me, but I'll tell you something. Women are loyal to one thing on the planet. And the only thing they're loyal to is, is the man they want to have sex with. So every time there was a girl who I wasn't sleeping with, she never lasted long. So. Then I had these four big premises, all these overheads, all these managers that got out of control. So I cut down to like a special forces team of around eight girls. And that's where I made my most money. When I had four girlfriends, my brother had four girlfriends, me, my brother, eight women living in one house. And all the women adored us and they obeyed us. And at the peak, I was turning over 400 grand a month. Only an English or an American girl is stupid enough to be a hoe for free. Because over here, they'll be a hoe because they were drunk. They'll just be a hoe because they're dumb. Oh, I slept with a bunch of men. Oh, he was funny. So he jizzed on me. Like, they're just idiots. In, the, in Eastern Europe, they're far too intelligent for that. They understand that the number one commodity a female has is beauty. And if they're born with it, they're not going to fucking waste it going out getting hammered and banging Joe whoever. They're not going to do that. They're not stupid like that. So Western girls are extremely easy to sleep with compared to Eastern European women. This is going to really piss the feminists off, but I'll tell you, it's the truth. It doesn't matter whether a woman wants to be a lawyer or a housemaker or a webcam girl. Unless she has a man directing her, she's gonna fuck it up. They're just not built to be completely independent creatures. The women who go, I'm strong and independent. You're working for a man in a company and you're getting fucked by 10 men a month. You're not independent. It's just a lie. It's a lie. You're, just, you're just undesirable. That's what you are. There's no such thing as an independent female. They're all relying on a man to some degree. Maybe I'm completely crazy. Maybe I'm full of shit, like you said. Ghetto friends, eight ghetto friends. You're making my life sound very, very interesting. <laughs> You're making my life sound good. Yeah, I do okay, man. I do okay. I just try and live as, as close as I, as I can to my masculine imperative without hiding who I want to be or what I want to do or letting society program me. And I think if you let, if you give a man true free reign, completely be who you want to be and you don't let society program you, he's gonna drive a fast car, he's gonna have a bunch of women, he's gonna to wanna to have a bunch of money, he's gonna do whatever he wants, right? We all wanna be free. So I try my very best to be free. What is free to you? That's a good question. 
And especially in the modern political climate with all this corona, et cetera, et cetera, I think freedom is being destroyed in real time. Even before corona, freedom is being destroyed. You, we, if, if you look at even very basic things, right? Like freedom of speech. If a man isn't free to say what he thinks in the way he wants to say it, if political correctness or hate speech or whatever, whatever, if a man can't even express himself the way he thinks it, is he free? You know? And what they do first is they restrict your speech because if they restrict your speech, then they can start to restrict your thoughts. If you're not allowed to ever say it, then you're probably not gonna think it so often. This is why it's done on purpose. So I don't think that society is very free at all. And I think that in, in regards to keeping our employment, keeping our money coming in, making sure we don't lose our social medias, every single person has to censor themselves to some degree. And I try very, very best to skirt that line you know, as far as possible. So I feel free. Freedom is the ability to scream when you want to scream, be angry when you want to be angry, smile when you want to smile, say what you want, do what you want. And, and that's a very, very rare commodity in the modern world. That's extremely rare. So that's what I would consider free. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I am uh, half English, half American. My father was in the Air Force. He was based at Chick Sands in the UK. He met my mother. Uh, they were fortunate enough to have this perfect child you see in front of you. <laughs> I have a brother. I have a brother and a sister. We moved back to America, and I lived the first ten years of my life in the in, in the United States. And my father was a chess master. That was his job. After he retired from the Air Force, he's a professional chess player. So I grew up around professional chess players, which is kind of an unusual climate to grow up in, because you're growing up around all these ultra intelligent, semi autistic. They're weirdos, right? Yeah. You you can't yeah. be you can't be that good at chess and be normal, right? It's the, they're like human calculators. They're all a bit strange, and you have ex KGB members and like math nerds, and it's just a very weird kind of climate. And my father was a chess master, but my father was very unique because my father was also a professional wrestler and had physicality. So you have like a bunch of dorks. Then you have my dad, this big black dude, and he's like competing in the chess world. So I grew up in a very kind of strange world and I was a professional chess player. I was on my path to being a professional chess player at the age of five. I was the state chess champion for Indiana and I was the best ranked player under the age of 10 and I was on my way. So I played chess for the early part of my life and then at the age of 11, my mother and father split up. My mom took me back to uh, Luton, great place. Lovely. Mm -hmm. so, so from the age of 11, I grew up in Luton. So that's the very beginning of the story. and. Uh, a lot's happened between now and then, and here I am. Yeah, that's a good question. And a lot of people talk about how stressful it was that their parents broke up. And I mean, obviously I was very, very young. I don't think I was necessarily too upset by it. You know, I was, I was still, my father was very realistic with me and he said, look, I'm still gonna see you, but you're going to England. It is what it is. So I don't think I was particularly upset by it. I definitely wouldn't say I was traumatized by it, but it did alter my life project tra trajectory because I lost my chess coach. Up until then, I played chess three, four hours a day. It's all I did was chess, chess, chess. When we left, not only is there no chess scene in England like there's in America. In America, there's lots of chess in the schools and these kind of things. There's no chess scene, plus I had no coach. So for a while, I was kind of lost, I would say. I had four hours free a day that I never used to previously have. And uh, I mean, I didn't get into too much trouble or too much mischief, but I was certainly a bit, how can I replace this thing I used to do all of the time? What did you replace it with? I ended up replacing it with fighting. Yeah, from a young age? From, from around about 15, 16, I started kickboxing. And I think that fighting and chess are extremely similar. To me, they, they aligned. They fulfilled the same gaps in my psyche, right? People always say, how did you go from being a chess player, which everyone sees as geeky, to a kickboxer? And I said, well, chess is chess is one-on-one -on -one battle, right? That's all it is. There's no luck involved. There's no team. There's no wind that can blow the ball. There's no, you know, it's one-on-one. -on -one. It's a fight. If you lose, you messed up. And fighting feels the same for me. So for me, I thought, well, okay, I, I can't learn chess well enough without a coach. And I can't find a coach in the UK who I trust to teach me chess, but I can find a coach who can teach me to kick people's ass. So that's kind of how, how it started. How did you end up going through the ranks and winning world titles? Fighting's kind of weird, right? Every, I think if you talk to any fighter, everyone who starts, I mean, lots of people say they had aspirations of being the world title, or the world champion at the beginning. I just turned up to training one step at a time, right? I just wanted to be good. So my coach said, you have to train seven times a week. I said, okay. So I just obeyed. I was just a worker ant. I just did as I was told. And then you win and you win again and you win again and you get a title shot, you win. And before you know it, you get up there. My first ever world title fight was on three days notice. So someone pulled out and I had three days notice. I had to lose nine kilo in three days. I turned up, obviously was completely destroyed from the weight cut. Everyone expected me to lose. And uh, I won. 
But they gave the, de- and I'll say I won because I did win. They gave the decision to the other guy. It was in France and it was in Paris and it was me against a French world champion. They gave it to him, but I whooped his ass, right? And we submitted the video to the ISKA, the organization, and they demanded a rematch because it was so obvious I won. And we fought again. And without the big weight cut problem, I, I, I knocked him out in the eighth and I became world champion for the first time. How was that for you? It was good, but you know, like, I don't ever feel like I'm satisfied. I never like won the world title and go, yes, I'm the champ now. It's mm-hmm. just like, okay, next, next, next. I was, I was kind of always like that. I always had these aspirations. I've always kind of felt without sounding like a crazy conspiracy theorist, even now to this day, I feel. Maybe, correct me, you're a smart man. So maybe this will make sense to you. Do you ever look around you and just look at the world and feel like, Kind of like we're in the Matrix. Like there's something missing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's just you feel it in your gut. Yeah, something isn't right here. Like yeah. everything just seems so superficial. And I, I don't know. I was always looking for this secret. I was always looking for, I wouldn't say happiness or contentment, but I was always looking to try and break out of the nine to five, just the normal monotony of day to day life. And, 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 I, and for a long time, I thought fighting was my way out. I don't know what I was trying to get to. I don't know where it was going to lead. But when I just look at the normal life a lot of people live, that is just absolutely depressing to me. Yeah. Like, I couldn't imagine doing it. I'm not shitting on the normal guy. I'm saying you're a stronger man than me. Because if I was a normal dude working in Starbucks, bro, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that day to day. I literally could not do that. And I thought fighting will make sure I never have to do that, if that makes sense. Did you ever find that sense of completion while you won in world titles or were you still unsatisfied? It's always someone new to beat up, right? Yeah. And then even then, you're de- I'm dedicating all my time to fighting, which is actually the reason I retired. I retired for four years. I came back last year and I fought three times. But uh, I actually retired because one day I woke up and I looked at my life and I thought, I'm giving seven hours a day to fighting. If I were to put seven hours a day into something else, what else could I achieve? Because I had a little bit of money from fighting, but I wasn't balling. I wasn't rich, rich. And I thought, what's the point in being the world champion if I can't buy Lambos on the debit card, right? What's the point? So then I thought, well, I want to be rich now. So that's, that's actually the reason I retired. So I was always chasing other things. And then now I've got money, I want to fight again. I'm, I'm never happy, bro. This is how it goes, right? You're always chasing something else. But I do feel like to a degree, I have at least partially escaped the matrix I used to be talking about. I, I kind of feel like I've started to escape. And Corona, as much as it's been a headache for everybody, has helped me realize how fortunate I am in my position to when everyone else is locked down, I can just get on a private jet and go where I want, right? So that it's kind of cool when they go, there's no flights. I'm like, not for you, <laughs> there's flights for me, bro. So it, it, it's kind of, I have, I felt like I've semi-escaped. So I've, I've kind of gone. Yes. Let's talk about the webcam business, yeah. yes. So that that's the story. So for anyone watching this who doesn't know my story, I'm fighting, I became four-time world champion. Uh, I was 28 when I won my fourth world title. And one day I woke up and I literally just woke up. I looked at my bank, I like, I mean, I just won a world title fight, but I hadn't fought in six months. By the time I paid all my back rent and paid my car payments, all that, I looked at my bank, I had like three grand, four grand in there, and I'm like, I'm giving up my entire life and I I don't even know how I'm gonna live. I need to get rich. I want to get rich. So I said to my coach, look, I'm gonna take a couple months off and I'm gonna focus purely on money. And the story is, and this is a completely true story, I'm sitting with my brother and I'm like, how can we get rich? You know what's amazing? Lots of Now I have money, lots of people always ask me, how do I get rich? And I say, when's the last time you talked about money? When's the last time you sat down with your friends and refused to talk about anything else but how to make money? How are you making money? How are you making money? How am I making money? How can we make money together? How's that guy making money? How's that coffee shop there making money? Is that coffee shop making money? I don't know, do they sell cake? No, why don't they sell cake? Everyone in here is a businessman. If they had a, a cute young waitress, a girl, instead of a guy, they'd probably sell more coffee. Like no one analyzes anything. They just wanna get rich, right? I wanna be rich, but they have no plan to get rich. And a hope and a plan are very different things. I explain this to people all the time. Everyone has a dream, but no one has a plan. And nothing good is gonna happen on accident, right? I didn't become world champion on accident. I didn't wake up and someone go, how'd you become world champion? And I went, oops, you you have to plan for it. So I said to Tristan, we need to discuss money. We need to plan this and we need to work out a way we can get rich. And that's when I started analyzing and understanding banks and the, the, the credit system and the money system, how the world actually works. And then I got really pissed off because I realized that money isn't real and it's all a scam. <laughs> and then the banks are destroying us in real time with inflation. And I still don't have any. So I was really mad. And uh, 
I'm writing down, I was reading, I was watching some YouTube videos, like financial advice, and we're talking about assets, liabilities, et cetera, and I'm writing down all my assets, and I'm trying to work out what I have that's worth money. And the only thing I wrote down, because I had a car, but what's that worth? Nothing. I'm, I'm big and strong, but I'm already fighting. I can't think of anything else to do with that. The only thing I had was, because I'd been fighting all around the world, I had these six girlfriends, right? Because you'd win the world title, you fuck a ring girl, she falls in love with you, you're the big millionaire in London, of course, she thinks, she thinks you're living the balling life, you're in some <laughs> tiny, tiny apartment with a door lock. So um, I had these girlfriends and I thought, well, I can't open a strip club, it costs money to open a strip club. And I'm kind of racking my brain and by absolute coincidence, I'm going around the internet and I saw in the corner, talk to live girls now. And I'd never in my life, like I was never a porn guy. I've never been watching porn or clicking on these things. And I said, talk to live girls. So I clicked on it and there's some chick there on a computer, like, hi, da -da. and I was like, my girls can do that. So that, that was the very beginning. That was the eureka moment. And I walked into my, my brother's bedroom and I said, we're gonna start a webcam company. Yeah, so, and this is the thing that's interesting about it. Cause when people hear this story and they say like a pimp, et cetera, people imagine me to be this exploitive, horrible, evil man which is absolutely and utterly the complete opposite. I'm not trying to convince the internet I'm a nice guy, right? Because I don't give a shit. I'm just telling the truth. So the beginning of it was I messaged my six girlfriends and told them they're all coming to live with me and I had a job for them in London. Uh, two of them wouldn't come, four of them agreed. And I was like, we're gonna make money, load money up, a bunch of money, you're gonna live with me, blah, 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 we're gonna live the dream. Right now I'm in between apartments, so I'm in this shitty apartment. <laughs> you know, because kickboxing's not boxing, bro. You're not making millions like the boxers are. So the four girls flew in. I sat them all down at a table. They're all like, who's this chick? Who's this chick? Told them all the truth. I just straight sat there. Just sat there and said, listen, I've been with you all. I'm starting a webcam business. I'm gonna get rich. Some of you are gonna come with me to the top of the mountain or if you're pissed off, you can fucking fly home. Just very matter of fact to the point because I needed money at this point. Now I have not agreed to take another fight. I need money now. So uh, two of them left. Two of them agreed to stay. And the beginning of my cam empire was this tiny little apartment, me and my two girlfriends living in this house, right? Um, and they went on cam together as a duo, as a team, to start making money. And that was the beginning of it. And the interesting, about it, the interesting thing about it was, these girls were so inept from a business perspective. Like they were very beautiful and they're nice girls. I can't say anything bad about them, but they were not, women do not have a business mind. So they'd sit on webcam, right? And uh, an old dude would sit there and the old dude would say, what kind of guy do you like? And they'd say, oh, I don't know, someone in shape who's rich and young. And I'm like, no, no, he's an old dude. You have to say, I'm tired of these young guys messing me around. I need an older guy who's ready to settle down. I don't care if he has money as long as he'll take care of me. Da -da. If he's a young guy, you say, I'm tired of these old guys perving on me. You need to sell the dream. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm training these girls. And it got to the point where it was easier if I just typed myself. So what we ended up doing was we had the two girls on camera with a keyboard, which wasn't plugged in, doing this. And then I was behind the screen talking to the dudes, saying the right things and start dragging money out the internet. And for me, I mean, this is a long time ago, right? This is about, how old am I now? I'm 34, so I was about 28. So about six, seven, maybe eight years ago, right? And making money online nowadays is far more popular than it was even eight years ago. Who do you know eight years ago who made money from YouTube or from online? Yeah, no, nobody. It's just booming, it's just starting. It's yeah. just starting.